have here a panel of experts who are going to talk, us, uh, talk to us about how the workforce will work with 5G. We've got Susan Lund, partner at McKinsey. We've got John Godfrey, a Vice President of Public Policy at Samsung Electronics of America, and Ian Popoff, the Chief Economist at ApartmentList.com. And with all these major changes that everybody's just been talking about, um, it's going to affect everything. John, I want to start with you to talk to how about how 5G, how we wrap our heads around it, how it is going to change every work, uh, workforce, every workplace. Sure, 5G is the most significant uh, transition in the history of mobile. And I, I say that because it's not only going co to connect people in their phones, but things as well. Everything in the world will be closer together because of 5G. And, and a way you can think about that is 4G, put the internet in your pocket on your smartphone, but 5G will be like the wireless equivalent of fiber in your pocket. It's a whole new experience. And not only in your pocket, but also in your car, in every street light down the road, in uh, every ambulance and emergency room, every machine in a factory, every seat in a stadium, every cow on a dairy farm <laughs> will be connected. So, so the, the world will be connected. It's going to change everything, not, not just the workplace, your home environment, all of it. But as far as the workplace goes, how do businesses get started in, in um, taking advantage of, of how this will work? Well, two, two different ways to think about that. One is as uh, carriers, like you know, Samsung's customers for our 5G base stations, as the mobile carriers deploy 5G as a commercial service that's broadly available, it means workers are going to be able to be anywhere. They'll be able to be connected to each other, to their customers, uh, to data, to computing, as the previous panel talked about. So it means the, the work environment will be more mobile and more ubiquitous. The other way that I like to think about it is 5G investments specifically in enterprise locations. And so whether it's a carrier going into an enterprise location and offering a service on behalf of the factory or the warehouse or the, the office or the hospital, or that enterprise setting up its own 5G equipment using unlicensed spectrum, either way, 5G will also transform specific workplaces. Susan, you had been saying that uh, when we spoke earlier that it was uh, that 5G is going to uh, really transform. Um, I believe it was uh, some of the countries where you can't teleconference now. It's really a lot more difficult in places like South America and Africa. So the connection won't be uh, isn't as good, but it will be. It will be. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a couple ways in which um, 5G is going to transform work. So I work at a global company, and I do teleconferences, try to do teleconferences with all, all parts of the world. And it, and it really doesn't work. But video conferencing is really going to become like you're there, sitting there talking to somebody right across from you, uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, virtual reality and augmented reality is going to become a reality in the workplace. So already, there are some companies who are starting to use these technologies in training. So you can get much more realistic training, whether it's a factory setting, healthcare, even things like retail learning uh, social skills. So you have Walmart is re retraining some of its mm -hmm. um, retail cashiers to roam the store floor and interact with customers. Well, you need to understand what does a customer with a question look like? And they're using virtual reality headsets to try to teach those interpersonal skills and communication skills. This is going to become ubiquitous. And I think work is also going to migrate all over the country. We're not going to be stuck in Washington and San Francisco and New York. Um, we're going to be able to tap into workforce all over the country. Uh, Igor, that's your bailiwick, right? Uh, it, how everybody will be in different places or not. We don't have to be at this conference. We just have to be dialed in. Right. It's almost like there are these two trains that are you know, on this path for collision. One is, you know, as we've talked about, just the, the huge jumps in capabilities that 5G is going to bring. But already, even on a separate track, we've been seeing this, this trend of the rise of remote work, um, both economically, culturally, since 2005. The number of people working from home in the U.S. has grown by 76%. Like, the fastest growing commute in the U.S. is already no commute. 
Um, and I like that. On the other hand, you know, you still see these industry clusters that are skeptical sometimes of remote work um, and, and what that's going to mean for, for business because, you know, you can't get across past the fact there are benefits to co-location, but the better these technologies get, and I think video conferencing will continue to be a game changer, messaging tools will continue to be a game changer, the, the better these technologies get, the more and more companies will continue to question, you know, do these benefits of co-location for this set of employees or for this team or for that team really, you know, outweigh um, some of the costs in terms of having everyone in a very expensive uh, business center. Um, and, you know, both in the data and even just in, in our business operations at Apartment List, we see that there is demand also from the labor force to work remotely, whether that's for for personal or professional or uh, um, lifestyle reasons, that people see that as an amenity, um, that, that people are seeking out jobs where they can have the company that they want to work at and have the place where they want to live and have those be decisions they make independently and figure out after the fact. Something that you had mentioned before with the rise of people working remotely is that it, people working remotely are not in their dream location. They're not on the beaches of Hawaii, but they're in mid-sized uh, cities, you said? That's right. You know, I mentioned this 76% you know, number, but in a place like Denver, the number of people working from home is almost tripled. In a place like Raleigh, it's grown by over 250%. So you know, maybe my dream would be, OK, I'm going to work remotely from, from a mountain somewhere where no one will bother me, and I'll you know, remote in and then just be in nature. But that's not what people are doing. And I think you know, the, to my point about the, the benefits of co-location can still exist for remote workers. They're just not happening within the same firm. So I might you know, be remote in Austin. I might not be in the same location as my other coworkers, but I still have access to a lot of mentorship, to a lot of uh, technical support from people in my industry across companies, just as I currently do as, a, as an economist in San Francisco, where I can walk down the street and talk to other people working on similar problems in different industries. In places like Raleigh, Denver, Austin, Portland, which are these emerging tech hubs where we're, we've really seen remote work grow tremendously, those are places where you can get benefits from co-location across industries. And I think that's, that's what we're seeing as opposed to you know, everyone finding their own little city, naming it after themselves, and working remotely. Uh, John, I wanted to ask you about another aspect of this, which is uh, the freelance economy, the gig economy. This is going to really explode. Both you and Susan are expert on this, but why don't you start? I think one of the unforeseen impacts of the 4G revolution was that it enabled social networking. I, I don't think people would be doing social networking to nearly the degree that they do if you had to be sitting at your desk on your desktop computer to do it. You, you, you know, it would only be those parts of the day when you're there. But it's become integrated into the fabric of people's social lives because they can carry their social network with them all the time in their pocket. And that's only possible because of 4G, you know, with, without that data connectivity, you wouldn't be able to see, see video and see pictures. And I kind of blows my mind to imagine what 5G social networking might be like. You know, it may be like virtual reality. Um, and as far as where workers are located, you know, I think, I think the kids in middle America, not in the edge, edgy cities, have integrated social networking into their lives, and I think they're going to expect to integrate digital collaboration into their work lives as they move into the workforce. Uh, Susan, are there uh, any downsides to uh, the, the uh, explosion in the freelance economy? I mean, people will be, uh, like you mentioned uh, you already, you can uh, post a, a job that you want to fill on a site, and people can all over the world can say, yeah, I can fill that. Is, is there a downside? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I mean, not a downside, but we're seeing the whole rise of Uber, of Airbnb, of TaskRabbit. The gig economy has always been around. People have been self-employed. There have been teachers who were tutors at night, and there are babysitters and gardeners and so on. So there are a lot of people who have lived a freelance lifestyle in a lot of professions, like dentists, therapists, doctors, that were traditionally one-man shops, right, self-proprietors. So we call all of this independent work. But digital platforms have now made this accessible to more people. So if I want to earn a little extra money, or my kids do, uh, they don't think about getting a part-time job. They actually think about, I'm going to tutor in math, or I'm going to walk dogs. 
um, it's really transformational to see for that generation. Absolutely. But I think that 5G is going to make this uh, even more possible. And companies, large companies, are already starting to tap into lower cost freelance talent. So there are platforms like Upwork, you can post um, a job to design a website or edit a paper or write some code. <coughs> and anyone in the world can bid on that, and they are. And now you're actually seeing sub-firms. So in India, somebody will contract, because of course you need the reputation to get the contract, so then they set up their own little shop and subcontract out. Um, but it's, it is it's spreading opportunity to different parts of the world and to smart, connected workers um, all over that need jobs. And so I, I, I kind of whiffed on the part of your question about the gig aspect of yeah. that, but it's through the social network that a lot of those gigs are, are won. It's true. Yeah. Sorry about that. It, exactly. It's the reputational impact. So it's really hard if you're sitting in Kenya and you haven't done any of these, nobody's going to hire you. So there is a repeated element to this, which is where social media comes in and also this you know, subcontracting out. But the key is you need to be connected. The big barrier, both in remote parts of the US, not in Austin and Seattle, but when you look across the US, there are 3,000 US counties. Uh, and work that we're going to be releasing in July suggests that job growth between now and 2030 is going to be concentrated in just really a handful of cities, like 25 cities including Austin and Seattle, are going to get 60% of job growth. And there are roughly 2,000 rural counties that are going to see almost no job growth or even declines. So there are huge swaths of the country uh, that are going to start to see a lot more geographic inequality. But things like 5G and remote work are maybe one solution to making sure everybody uh, gains. Um, another solution you had mentioned before, too, would be education, an educated workforce. Absolutely. I mean, the explosion of online learning is now really becoming a reality. It's not just the oddity of, I'm going to take a course at Harvard about ancient history, right? Uh, companies are now very actively working, both with universities like Georgia State or Arizona Uni mm -hmm. University. Arizona State. ASU yeah. has been really uh, active, as well as online course providers like Coursera or Udacity, to develop tailored training programs for their workforce uh, through these online learning courses. Because companies have realized that's a lot more effective than trying to design and run training programs in-house. And so it's really opening up a whole set of opportunities for people in the workforce to stay fresh with their skills and do it through online learning. Well, with 5G, that can also be expanded to the developing world. You could be doing this anywhere in the world, including on your mountaintop. That's right. And I think the, the question about geographic inequality is one of the big open questions that, that we have because <laughs> I think one of the big ironies, I think, in the past 20 years in the rise of technology is that it's had a really opposite effect on consumers and producers. So consumers are now able to connect with people, with goods, with ideas across vast distances very easily. And for some reason, the people that make all those tools tend to want to work within feet of each other or within you know, blocks of each other. Um, and, and people have spread, consumers have spread out, but industries have clustered. And so, the big open question, I think, for us now is, are we going to see the end of that clustering now that we're, you know, even when I do sit you know, feet away from my counterpart, we're still on Slack. <laughs> and we're, we're having this, you know, you know, we're referencing documents, we're referencing code, but we're actually interacting in a way that any uh, remote worker could also be a part of seamlessly. With that said, you know, there's still going to be, I still wouldn't want to get fired remotely. I would want that to be, a, you know, I still want to get bad news from the doctor remotely. I would still want to be promoted face to face, you know. So, you know, where do we reach and for which tasks do we reach that, that, that barrier where at the end of the day we're still humans and we want to talk to a person that's sitting right there. But, but it's not going to be for everything. There's just going to be some subset of tasks that are probably untouchable, but it need not be everything that we need to be within feet of each other. And, and it might that, that kind of you know, shift actually you know, ameliorate some of the rising inequality, especially the geographic inequality. I think that's, there's a lot of potential. I also wanted to ask the other side of that. We had talked about that uh, a couple days ago when you had mentioned that uh, there are um, 
in, in terms of co-location, there are benefits, not only just being fired in person, but uh, there are some <laughs> benefits to working, this, the social aspect of working together. Mm -hmm. um, will 5G enhance it? Will we lose that? Will it just broaden to include, you know, the guy from across the country? There will definitely be new business school courses on managing a remote workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's going to be a whole new set of things that, that industry leaders think about that they had it before. What happens when you have a manager who's remote, who's managing a team of people that are all in one space? That creates a whole set of challenges and opportunities. What happens when you have a whole team that's in one place, but one person that's remote? That creates a whole new, you know, so there are all these, you know, also tactical business and management skills that we've never had to learn before that, that are going to be just part of the playbook going forward, I think, with the rise of a remote workforce. Yeah, I think it's going to become easier, though, with 5G, because already um, the rise of telecommuting, which has been around since the 90s, right? So this is an evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's made it a lot harder. I talked to lots of managers who say, you know, in the old days when people came to the office and you could just visually see my 100 people are here, I can see who's here, I can see who's working. Now, if you're on the road in sales, consultant life, you're at a client, you're working from home, it's a lot harder to monitor. Uh, but 5G, I think, sadly will erode privacy maybe, but make it easier to see who's doing what. Mm -hmm. Things like wearables, who's online, what are you actually doing. Mm -hmm. For some remote call center workers, companies can already do this. They can monitor keystrokes on the keyboard and they can see how many calls are you answering. So. Um, then we have issues of privacy and, you know, corporate surveillance or, uh, in some parts of the world, state surveillance is an issue. Yes. And Joan, it, it, we've talked a lot about collaboration aided by 5G. It also means, and the previous panel talked about this a little bit, having accesses, access to more resources when you're not in the office with mm -hmm. your fellow workers. Right. Having huge amounts of computing power, huge amounts of data available to you when you're on the customer's site or out in the field doing something. And uh, 5G is a two-way network. It, not only will the computing come to you when you're in the field, but also the data from the field will be going back to computing. I like to think about some kinds of jobs that can be transformed, that can be done out in the field uh, with the assistance of the, the camera on your smartphone and some image recognition that's going on back in the internet cloud. Uh, it can actually, you know, diagnose a problem with a machine or a, or a tractor and uh, in real time tell you what you need to do to fix that problem instead of having to bring that machine back to a central location where you are repairing it there with all your, your coworkers. Because I am what Igor would call a super commuter. We've discussed a little bit about this. I wanted to ask you about this. It also changes not the people who work remotely, but the people who will still come into the office through commuting. Traffic is going to be dip monitored completely differently. I, I use Waze every time I get in my car. I mm -hmm. think it's a perfect yes. application of the Internet of Things. And with 5G, it's going to be e even better. I think it'll, it'll be able to tell which lane you're in uh, and, and guide you a lot better than it does today. And that's made possible by the sharing of, of all of that data. Uh, fully autonomous driving is a number of years off, but there are uh, app, you'll, it'll be available in enterprise locations for things like delivery trucks in a factory or a warehouse or something like that. But enhanced driving safety enhanced driving efficiency. 5G is bringing all of those things uh, in the near term. Vehicles will be connected and your commute will be safer, faster, and more fun. You said the other day that services are going to expand and we don't even know how. You know, it, there's ways that are, are going to be, we can't even think of right now. Yeah, we're, we're, we're all talking about applications of 5G. If we were 10 years ago talking about applications of 4G, we probably would not have mentioned ride sharing or social networking. They hadn't been invented yet. Some kid in their parents' garage today is, invent is inventing absolutely transformative applications of 5G that none of us have thought of. Amazing. I want to underscore that, that point. I mean, I don't think we can imagine exactly what 5G is going to bring. 4G and 3G brought the you know, web to our pockets. It brought us Netflix and streaming. Like, who buys 
music or, or right. you know, television anymore. Who watches network television? Uh, and then, you know, and we've got Bloomberg. Bloomberg we've channel. Got right. Bloomberg excluded. We've got, uh, you know, we've got share the platform economy, the sharing economy. Um, I don't think we can envision how 5G will transform our lives. We can point to areas I'll be happy when my car tells the city that there's a pothole. Your commute right. might be better uh, with it, and, and it gets fixed. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see big environmental impacts, potentially. Um, ag tech or agriculture technology is one of the hottest areas of development right now. And you're talking about like drone delivery of individualized amounts of water, pesticide, and, mm -hmm. and fertilizer to a plant because of the computing at the edge. So you can monitor and, and have individualized treatment of plants to Logistics becomes minimize much more chemicals and water right. and, and increase productivity. It all becomes much more efficient. Logistics becomes much more efficient then. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. All right. Um, the, the next thing I had wanted to talk about was um, something you, one of you mentioned before, I think it was you, John, uh, or, or Igor, about ma uh, management courses that will spring up and how to remotely manage um, uh, you know, your, your team. Uh, because that's going to be hard for some people to let go of and some companies to let go of. And uh, I think different people will embrace it differently. I think, you know, there are probably some people that thrive being in an office and some people that thrive having their head down and being uh, uh, a remote, remote worker that isn't bothered by you know, the noise of an open workspace. Um, and managers are gonna have to recognize that and adapt to that. So I don't think you're ever gonna see you know, a full shift towards one or another. I think it's the flexibility that, that is, is gonna bring a lot of the opportunity. And you had said a few days ago about companies that will follow their workers. Absolutely. I think now it's, you know, you're a large company that's looking to open up your next satellite office. It becomes a simple, well, where are my workers? Uh, they already moved to here and here. There's already a cluster of them here. Well, why not maybe start with a co-working space, but then eventually that might be the next, the next office. Um, and I think that's part of what you're seeing with um, migration to these uh, emerging mid-sized tech hubs from you know, the, the standard uh, you know, San Francisco's, New York, Seattle's of the world is that when someone chooses to open up a new office in Nashville, a lot of their workers are already there. And, and it makes it a lot, a, a lot easier to kind of pay those fixed costs because they're, they're actually not that big. So instead of moving to the home office, the home office moves to you. Right. <laughs> right. Um, John, we had talked about uh, what's next. I mean, we don't know what's coming for 5G. What's next for uh, beyond that? Beyond 5G. Beyond well, 5G. Clear, obviously 6G. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and, and researchers are actually developing that. So even faster, lower energy, more mobile, uh, lots of capabilities. But look, give, give us a little time to, to absorb and innovate on top of 5G. Uh, one, one application of 5G I think is relevant for today's topic that I'm really, really excited about is the potential to bring people with disabilities into the workforce and empower people to live more independently. If you imagine being able to walk down the street, you've got a camera on you that is streaming video to a service in the cloud where it is recognizing the data and processing it and figuring out where you are, what you're looking at, you're in a grocery store, it guide you to pick out the item that you need uh, maybe you know, speak to an earbud in your ear w and give you advice back, you can live independently. And we can bring people with visual or mobility or hearing disabilities into the workforce. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really excited about it. As part of the health thing, even for elder care, I would imagine that would be an, uh, a, a burgeoning uh, yeah. business. All, all of us will have disabilities if we get old enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, definitely, uh, just as workers want to be able to work at home, uh, older people would like to stay at home uh, and and stay in their familiar environment as they get older. And I mean, one of the benefits of connectivity is is to enable healthcare workers on the scene to be able to help you and perhaps have instrumentation in your house that's helping make sure that uh, uh, an older person isn't having a problem and and uh, uh, enable family members to be alerted. This all sounds like it's, it's basically aimed at large companies, but with the rise of, of independent contractors, 
it's small businesses as well. Susan? Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the big transformations of this era of technology has been um, the ability of small businesses and even micro businesses to, for instance, tap global markets and to compete with the big guys. So I love applications like iZettel, which was bought by PayPal. Mm -hmm. So a, a merchant anywhere in the world, it started in Europe for people selling at farmer's markets. So if you accept payment on your phone, you can then start tracking which customers are buying what. This is working for small shopkeepers in Mexico, in Africa, in India. Um, you know, I'm old enough where in the 90s, I was with a consulting firm, uh, McKinsey, and we were helping companies spend hundreds of millions and in some cases billions of dollars on enterprise resource software to be able to do things like marketing analysis. You can now do that if you accept digital payment through iZettle. It will tell you, oh, you sell more shampoo on Friday and this customer is a, re you know, is a really good customer. Mm -hmm. This is now being brought down to the little guy mm -hmm. and this used to be the purview only of companies that could invest. So I think there is a big opportunity for technology to, it's already lowered the cost of starting a business, but being able to run it more efficiently like big corporations run. That's, that's amazing, that is really changing. Yes, absolutely. But um, in terms of the workforce, we're gonna have to redefine jobs and what our jobs and job skills are now because of 5G. Do you see that? Well, we, it, we do, and I think this is gonna be a good revolution. If we can break down uh, our fixation on degrees. So employers have used uh, a degree, which college you went to, what did you study, what, was your, what were your grades? This is a very, very cr crude proxy for what any worker can do. And then after you've been out in the workforce, you're learning on the job all the time, no matter where you are, and you have no way to demonstrate that. And I think a world in which uh, employers start saying, here are the skills we need, not here's the degree we want you to have, uh, and then open it up to anyone with those skills. And then on the worker side, enable workers to track what are my skills. In LinkedIn, I'm sure we all have LinkedIn profiles, and you know they have the skill badges, and people you know, say you can do this and that. I mean, this is like a very crude beginning to what will be possible for people to demonstrate, here are my skills in a very granular way, and for employers to forget about degrees and think about what are the skills I need someone to have. Mm -hmm. um, it, it makes it uh, harder or easier to find people when you open up your floodgates with all those people. It makes it easier. And there are companies already doing this. So the Markle Foundation has a program with LinkedIn called Skillful, and it started in Colorado. And they work with, uh, because Colorado was a burgeoning high tech uh, center, and they couldn't find people. And so Skillful is helping people, for instance, like a FedEx driver. What skills does a FedEx driver have? Well, it turns out they're very logical. They know how to order, you know, load the truck in a certain order, deliver on time, follow directions. And that's a great project manager at an aerospace company. And so by focusing on what skills do you need rather than what profile do you think you're looking for as an employer, you open the aperture and you find all sorts of talent you would have missed. Sounds we go from, like, as if we're going from hierarchical structures to um, more sideways, you know, more uh, linking things more symmetrically. Go ahead, you were gonna say something? Oh, yeah, I mean, I think that there's just huge potential here, and there's all sorts of gamification to figure out what skills people have. So now, uh, when you apply to a big company, you may be asked to take an online, play an online game. And it's actually measuring, do you work in teams? Are you a leader? How do you solve problems? Um, so before you even get to an interview, but this, again, gets at the um, all sorts of psychometric skills as well as problem solving and other types of skills. And this means you don't need to spend huge amounts of money. We have a big student debt problem in this country. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard about. Student debt is now higher than credit card debt and it stays with you forever. It's the one kind of debt in the United States you cannot default on. So it follows you around. And, and we may get to a world where we focus more on credentials rather than degrees. Uh, which would be helpful for a lot of people burdened by debt. What haven't we covered? We're coming to the end of our half hour here. What haven't we talked about? Well, I think, you know, playing, playing off of some, some of what Susan was talking about, one of the things you can't necessarily measure through a credential 
uh, is the judgment that someone has developed or the creativity or some of the interpersonal uh, communication skills that people have. Maybe those are specific types of skills in what you were talking about, but uh, I think 5G can help empower uh, a worker with data and computing, but it's, it's not gonna replace the judgment, the ability to uh, anticipate problems that, that a human can bring to a situation um, or to interact with other humans. It might, though, replace the need to memorize a whole lot of facts uh, to the point where, you know, that, that's relevant if you're gonna win a lot of money on Jeopardy, but uh, <laughs> otherwise, maybe you just carry all the facts around with you in your pocket. Thank you so much, Igor, John, Susan. We've had a, a really informative half hour. Thank you very much. Thank you.